Oh, awesome. Grace and peace, everyone. According to the interwebs, we are now live. So I will give it a couple seconds for a couple of people to jump in. <clears throat> Looking forward to an awesome discussion with um, both um, the audience and um, Dr. Matt Bates about his phenomenal book. So when you get in, jump in in the chat and you know let us know you're here. Give us a little greeting. Um, very much looking forward to this. Uh, there we go. We have the beginnings of an audience. Phenomenal. Just waiting for a couple more people to log in. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and roll the intro. Oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. See some people in there. What's up, Patrick? Grace and peace, everyone that's in the chat and all of the viewers. Um, thanks for tuning in from Northern California. Um, as mentioned in all our talking, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> What's up, Mr. Phil Fox? Good to see you, brother. Um, we have with us today a very, very, very special guest, Dr. Matthew Bates. Dr. Bates has written many awesome books. Uh, Gospel Allegiance is one that probably my favorite only because I've read it significantly more than once. Um, the, his most recent one is The Gospel Precisely. And um, I think we are in for one heck of a discussion today. So let me, enough with the debate, and let me go ahead and bring in Dr. Matt Bates. Um, good to have you, Dr. Bates. Grace and peace to you, sir. And thank very, you. very, very much thank you for joining us. It's an honor to have you here with us. Hey, thank you so much, Greg. I, I love your intro. Um, man, you're running a slick show here. That was, that was pretty special. Us nerds can do that sometimes. <laughs> Make a whole little look like a whole lot. It looks like there's a whole studio and a, a support team, and it's literally just me and the cat and the dog. <laughs> well, you know what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's honored. Honored. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Phil Fox, for joining us. Um, so, Dr. Bates, um, and I know you did tell me to call you Matt. I will try my best to remember that. Um, tell us a bit about um, yourself. Just give us a quick intro, and then we'll dive pretty much into the content. We'll dive into the you know the book and some questions. Oh, for the audience, we will absolutely be having a Q and A. We'll be having so get your questions prepped as usual. Um, type your question and preface them with capital letters. Question so that I can pick them up quickly, and then we'll hand them off to Dr. Bates to get your responses. In addition to that, there will be multiple giveaways of the gospel precisely. I have at least five copies of it I can give away. If the engagement is bananas, I we can go up to 10 copies of the book to give away. Um, I, hopefully, I won't do like last time and give away all, including my own copy. Um, but nonetheless, um, the book is phenomenal. It is paradigm shifting. It is now in my top three must read books if you are a Christian wanting to be serious about your Christian walk and understanding the Bible. Um, this is one of the books you need to read because it it, it illuminates so much of what um, you know it, it, the Bible says about what's basically our core Christian belief. So um, Dr. Bates, tell us a bit more about you know your history, why you got into writing because it seems like a lot of your text is around you know gospel, allegiance and I'd, I'd connect to it ten, tangentially orthogonally faith as well how why are you so passionate about that well gosh I, yeah when you give me the invitation to help tell my whole story right i mean that could be the whole hour that's risky um i've been a christian um as long as i can remember uh, as uh, one of my very first experiences that i can remember would be you know praying a sinner's prayer and asking jesus into my heart as that was how it was framed for me uh as a child uh and uh, that was my mother uh leading me to jesus 
Um, and I remember that like very emotionally, even when I was four years old, like weeping over my sin and, you know, like praying on a certain, I remember the couch I was praying on. Um, so I've been a Christian as long as I can remember, but also um, the more I learn, right, as I follow Jesus, uh, the more I also realize that although that kind of way of presenting the gospel is saving and effective for many of us, it's also missing some key elements and that you can, you can end up falling off uh, the Christian path perhaps uh, if, um, yeah, if there's not a holistic presentation of the real gospel. And that was a little bit of my story as I, um, we didn't, weren't really churchgoers, even though my mom was very devout. Um, and you know, it was not until junior high that I got uh, baptized and got into a youth group, got more serious about my faith. But at the same time, there was, um, quite a bit of darkness I was allowing in, um, you know, through, um, yes, yeah, some problems that I was engaged in, especially, you know, with, with a girlfriend and some things were probably shouldn't have been going on. And it just wasn't a, a, some darkness in my life that needed to be cleaned up by Jesus, the King. But that was part of the problem, right? Was that I'd embraced Jesus as savior. And there was some vague sense that, okay, like, I guess he's like Lord too. Um, but there wasn't a, a real holistic understanding that Jesus is the King. Um, and so really it was when I went to college, my sophomore year of college, I took a course on the New Testament and we did nothing but read the New Testament for three weeks. Um, and through that experience in Dr. Roger Morling's class of reading the, the New Testament, um, I began to realize that the call to discipleship involved a whole lot more. Um, and there was a lot more going on in the New Testament than just praying a sinner's prayer. Um, and that I needed to, um, if I was going to follow Jesus and he was going to clean up these things in my life, uh, then I needed to... Um, yeah, to rededicate my life to him as as my Lord and and to uh, begin serving. And so uh, that was transformative for me. And it also inspired me to want to learn more as uh, as I was pursuing a physics degree at that time. But um, but finished that degree out, but began to lose interest in it and began to, to think that my deepest questions and my deepest longings uh, can be answered by um, understanding um, theology, philosophy, scripture, how these all interconnect. Uh, and it began the journey of learning for me. Oh, a little more on me. Sorry, I, I'm now associate professor of theology at Quincy University, been teaching in higher education for, I guess, some 13 years now. Gregory, you're, mu you're muted to me, at least. Still muted. Are you? I think you're muted to others too, Gregory. Am I back now? You're back now. Yep. What actually happened was my microphone got unplugged. Ah, uh, yeah. All the technology in the world will not prevent. <laughs> no, that's true. Poorly plugged in cable. Um, anyway, thanks for that intro, yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Bates. That was awesome. I see we have several people here um, commenting already in the chat. Thank you for joining everyone. Lelia, Carmel Crunk. Um, I think I said Mr. Phil Fox already. This is awesome. Let's jump in a bit to the book. Um, so I have this email that I read for you already, Dr. Um, Bates, but I will read this. So I've been encouraging, you know, people to read um, Gospel Precisely because, I, like I said, I think it's an important book. I got this email. This was sent at 11.06 p.m. this Wednesday. I'm going to um, keep it anonymous, but it, it, this is legit. This is not me sending this email or me asking someone to send this email. This was someone sending this email as a reaction to having, you know, starting to read um, the gospel precisely. And I quote, after being a Christian for at least 54 years, this is the first time I'm reading a teaching about Jesus as king and having allegiance to him. This was never stressed. Now I'm seeing it everywhere in the Bible. Wow, just read Acts. I still remember my pastor teaching the book of Acts verse by verse. And Jesus' as king was not centrally or actually ever even taught, let alone allegiance. Father, please forgive my ignorance. 
And then she quotes from the book, um, <clears throat> the largest problem within Christianity today is the exclusion of Jesus's kingship from the gospel. The exclusion of Jesus's kingship from the gospel. Unpack that statement for us a bit, Dr. Bates. Why is that the largest problem in Christianity today? Well, I think that it's the largest problem in Christianity today because we have inherited uh, very transactional ideas about the gospel. And what has happened through that, and this is really a legacy um, within Christianity that stems before the, the time period of the Reformation um, in, in, the, you know, in the 16th century and, 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 and trickled down through the Reformation. Um, so it's really universal to Christianity, but the, the, the problem was a very transactional idea where that the main point is that we need Jesus's merit. OK, uh, this really goes back to Anselm and you know, some other thinkers before this time. But that, that that's our main problem is that, like, we have a deficit in our account. OK, like we've sinned against God and we need to make satisfaction in some way for our sin and that Jesus alone can supply the merit that we need. And so what we need to do is we need to have a transaction. OK, and how does that transaction work? It works because God allows substitution. OK, and so. Um, what I need to do then is I need to trust that this is actually all true and that Jesus's sacrifice can cover my sin and provide the merit that I need. And that if I do that, then um, my account before God is taken care of. I'm innocent before God or righteous or justified. Um, and then I get to go to heaven. Um, that's the that's a transactional kind of understanding. And uh, one of the things you'll notice is although it captures a lot of things that are true, there's a lot of truth there. Um, on the other, on the one hand, it captures a lot that's true, but on the other hand, it really puts a lot of its gospel energy on on believing the atonement to be true or trusting the atonement to be true, which means the covering over of sins, right? And when I look in Scripture, I see that the gospel is shaped differently than that. Interesting. How, unpack that part a bit more. How is the? As a matter of fact, let's take a step back. I'm going to ask you to define two key terms that I think are poorly defined <clears throat> from a biblical perspective, largely based on what you know I've read in your books. But this correlates with what I read in Dr. Heiser's work, um, several Dr. Stephen DeYoung's work, like several um, 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 biblical scholars, like legit biblical scholars, all kind of key in on this. Let's talk about what the gospel is, like define that term that gets bandied about so casually. And subsequent to that, I'm going to ask you to define faith as well. But let's start with the gospel. Okay, well, the word gospel is uh, in Greek, the word euangelion. And um, it was a word that was in, in use within the larger Greco-Roman world. So this was not like a distinctively Christian word, uh, but it was also used in the Old Testament um, as uh, the prophet Isaiah, for instance, uses um, uh, yeah, the verbal form for a gospel to announce God's reign and, and the recovery of God's reign over Zion and things like that. But the, the word means good news. Um, and it could be used for, for anything to, you know, in the ancient world, anything from like a fish sale, right? Like, hey, there's fish for sale. It's good news, right? Or to like winning a prize at a theater competition. We have extant evidence that um, whenever someone won a prize, that that was considered good news. Um, but it it be, it came to be used especially in contexts uh, where there was something of empire wide significance that needed to be announced, and that had to do with um, the kingdom, right? And so, for instance, um, whenever there was a battle, right, and um, and, uh, you know, like, let's just say, you know, Athens was, you know, victorious over Sparta, right? A runner might be dispatched to go back and share that good news, right? And to tell the king or to tell those in, you know, in, in a democratic society in charge, right? Um, that indeed good news, there's good news, right? There's gospel uh, that we've, we've won the victory. Um, and so it, it, it came to be associated, especially with with him with a message of good news that had to do with empire-wide significance and we see this for example um at the time period of jesus outside the bible uh with the jewish historian josephus um and i'm just going to read a quote i just ha i have some, some some material in front of me i'm going to read a quote uh on the gospel from josephus um and this is from his jewish war josephus says this he says fame carried the news about vespasian abroad more suddenly than one could have thought now, Vespasian has become the new emperor, is what's gone on here, right? And that he was emperor over the East, upon which every city kept festivals and celebrated sacrifices and oblations for such gospel, euangelia, 
uh, such good news. Um, and so we see that it was a message that pertained to a new emperor beginning to reign. And so whenever we get to the New Testament and the New Testament summarizes the gospel in places like Acts 5, 42, it says that the apostles went about gospeling all the time, right? And what were they gospeling? It, it summarizes, it's just that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, that's what they're gospeling. And the word Christ means king, or right? it's a specific Jewish style king. And so as the New Testament summarizes the gospel for us, one of its most frequent um, and comprehensive summaries is just to say it's the announcement that Jesus has become king or is the king. Awesome. Awesome. And there's some questions already. I'll, I will get to them. There's one really good question from um, Mr. Phil Fox, but um, I'll digress for a minute. Um, what about um, faith? Um, contingent on the gospel seems to be faith. Like, And in our context, very obviously, faith is, you know, this belief thing. It's a mental exercise, you know. Hebrews 11, 1, you know, faith is evidence of things not seen, substance of things hoped for. I probably got that backwards. Um, but, you know, it, it's this, if I think hard enough, if I wish hard enough, you know, it's mine. Um, you said in, I believe it was Gospel Allegiance, Paul used terms like pistis on purpose unpack faith for us in the context of that Greek term. I think it's Greek pistis. What is yes. faith exactly? Yeah. So the Greek term pistis is traditionally been translated uh, into English as faith, but also faithfulness. Um, and we find it translated as faithfulness in a number of places in the New Testament because it has to be translated that way. Like Romans 3.3 3 would give you an example of a place where it talks about, um, you know, um, like, God's faithfulness, for instance, and it, it's not God's faith in somebody, it's God's faithfulness in context in that passage, right? Um, so it's a word that um, has tra traditionally been translated faith, but also can mean faithfulness. And this is something that New Testament scholars and biblical scholars have known always. Um, what has not been as carefully observed is that um, that, that word also um, shades into meaning of loyalty or allegiance. And again, this would be something that a lot of biblical specialists might know, but it hadn't been applied very carefully to New Testament texts. Um, and so that's been some of my research work has been um, wanting to explore, um, should Pistis be translated as allegiance more often in our texts and making a, the case that indeed it should be. Um, and uh, of course, like on an academic level, that would be more technical work that I do, um, that I'm popularizing um, after that, I think has been vetted by other people. Other people have agreed, yes, yes, indeed, there's something to this. Um, and I popularized into the books like um, the Gospel Precisely and Gospel Allegiance. Um, so the, the basic argument works this way, okay? If the Gospel is mostly royal, okay, and it's mostly about Jesus becoming king and then the saving benefits that follow from that, right? Um, like our forgiveness of sins, right, and so on and so forth. But if the gospel is mostly a royal proclamation, then what does it mean whenever we're called to respond to the gospel with faith? Does it mean something closer to a response of allegiance? And I make the case, yes, indeed, it does mean that. And this is partly because of just how words mean things in general, right? Um, that we actually take words and we apply we apply their meaning by applying the appropriate social frame or, or or context. And so, if the social frame is royal, right, the most natural context in which we're going to find um, the word pistis when we're talking about the gospel is allegiance or loyalty um, kinds of ideas. So, the word pistis is a big plastic word. It sometimes means belief. It sometimes means trust. Uh, and it sometimes means something more like loyalty or allegiance. It's maybe better to see that it often means all those things blended together. Um, but we don't want to exclude the allegiance meaning. Uh, we want to we want to help people to see that that's actually a prominent and important meaning uh, that might actually help us better understand salvation. Why why is that? Why is allegiance, which I I, I I'm certain is not nearly as well known or as popular as it should be. Um, so versus just believing, um, why is allegiance so important to the concept of salvation? Well, because the purpose of the gospel has often been misunderstood um, in Scripture, like that it's been assumed um, rather than 
demonstrated that in the New Testament, well, the purpose of the gospel is in order to get you saved so you can go to heaven, right? Like that's the purpose of the gospel. Um, more precisely, when we look at the New Testament and what it says about the purpose of the gospel, we can look at passages like Romans 1.5 and Romans 16.26. And in Romans 1.5, for instance, um, Paul has just presented the gospel, um, and we could get into the details of that more as you wish, in Romans 1, 1 through 4, where he talks about the gospel that's been promised in advance, uh, that it um, concerns you know being born into the line of David, right, and, and also being installed as son of God in power. Right. But then after after Paul says all that, um, he, he says, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right. And talks about how Jesus is the king and our Lord. And, and then he he continues on. And Paul says that um, that this Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right. Um, that he uh, is the one who through whom we received grace and apostleship, Paul says, mm -hmm. for the obedience of Pistis and all the nations in behalf of his name. So uh, this Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the one through whom we receive grace and apostleship for the obedience of pistis. Now, if we understand pistis to be like just general belief or trust, we might think that, well, really the point of the gospel is that we would believe things and then we would obey. But actually, when we understand the, what's going on in Greek more carefully there, that language, uh, obedience of faith, the uh, uh, the the the, the hupakae verb, uh, uh, excuse me, noun with the pistis noun, it probably means something more like loyal obedience or allegiant obedience, because in context we're talking about a king and our Lord, right? Jesus Christ, the King, our Lord, right, is who we're talking about here. So, what's the purpose of the gospel more explicitly in Scripture? It's actually not so that we can go to heaven. That's not the main purpose. It's actually so that all the nations would begin to give their loyal obedience or their allegiant obedience to Jesus. Oh, holy cow, that's a that's a thoughtful, that's a mouthful. Um I I I don't want to beleaguer the point too much, but could you reiterate that again? The point of of Christianity, the point of being saved is not just to save us from um not going to hell, you know, hey, it gets you an entrance card into heaven, but what? It's the obedience of of allegiance or the obedience of loyalty among all the nations and whenever we have the obedience of loyalty we can we can make that adjectival right just loyal obedience or allegiant obedience in all the nations um is what paul says the purpose of the gospel is and he actually says it twice he says that, that that's romans 1 uh 1 5 i was quoting to you but he says it again in romans 1 uh, excuse me in romans 16 25 through 26. he says uh he's speaking about his the gospel paul says my gospel and the preaching about jesus the king jesus the messiah right um which has been made manifest according to the revelation of mystery and he he continues elaborating a little bit more there but then he circles back and he says the that the purpose of all this is for the obedience of pistis and all the nations so again the purpose of the gospel paul says is for the obedience of loyalty in all the nations so yeah um so the idea would be that whenever we're raised up from the dead, right, on uh, those who are united to Jesus's resurrection are raised up from the dead, then we'll rule with him. And that the purpose of the gospel is that everyone, all nations will join in that so that they're loyal to Jesus, the king, and that they're serving as uh, sub kings and queens underneath the high king, Jesus, the king. Wow. Wow. So you just touched on something that I find very interesting. This is kind of a personal to me thing, just because of a lot of what we're seeing in the world now, a lot of death with COVID, et cetera. A lot of the church, I think, not really re knowing how to react, which granted, it's a unplanned, unexpected. We couldn't have prepared for it really, you know, pandemic with, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not more people dying. Um, how does this, the kingship of Jesus, relate to our, how does it change how we should react to death? What are your thoughts about, because I believe a part of what Christ came to do was, I think it's called, I think the technical term is Christus Victor. Um, you mm -hmm. know, a part of it was him defeating the powers of death, hell, and the grave. Um, you know, as promised since I think it was Genesis 3 or so, you know, where a seed of the woman will, you know, um, bruise the serpent's head. Um, how do those two things interact? Is is there an interaction there even? Yeah, well, I think you're right that um, as Christians, we um, part of our response to COVID should be that we should certainly not be afraid of death in the same way that the world is, right? That we have our resurrection hope that Jesus has defeated death, 
right? And that um, in light of that, as we give our loyalty to Jesus the King, right? Um, and uh, as part of that, we experience the benefits of his forgiveness, yeah, right? Realizing our loyalty is not perfect any more than our faith might be perfect as traditionally conceived, right? Our, our, our imperfect loyalty unites us to Jesus, the perfectly loyal King, right? And, um, and, and through that, then we are, um, uh, uh, we're saved over death. So I think that one of the things that I've seen in the COVID crisis that I think um, has been a little bit disappointing to me um, has been, I think, sometimes I've seen in Christian circles a reaction to COVID that would suggest a fear of death or that um, our, our work of sharing the gospel is somehow less important during this time, but keeping people healthy is what's important. Um, those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, like hopefully we can share the gospel while keeping people healthy, right? Um, but um, the urgency of their eternal life, right, that they need to have the resurrection life of Jesus at work in them um, should uh, be something that um, supersedes our concerns over our more near-term health. So um, we want to be good. We want to be loving to other people. We want to make sure that, you know, part of loving them is that if they're afraid of death, that that we don't want to infect them with COVID needlessly. Right. I, mean, I think we need to be good citizens in that sense. But we also need to, as part of that, say, you know, there's something more important going on here than your immediate health. Right. What, what about your what about your eternal life? Do you have the resurrection life at work in you? Right. Um, is a question I think that we need to be asking um, during this this difficult season. So, yeah, I, I would encourage Christians to be bolder um, in using this as an opportunity to um, to share um, the gospel of eternal life. So interesting, you said that you actually very intuitively, I would say, or we just in some kind of a weird nerd mind meld. Um, I can't remember if Dr. Bates said this pre the, the live or at the beginning in his intro, but he also has a degree in physics. So he's officially inducted into my hall of geekery and nerd awesomeness. So we are now nerds alike. Mm -hmm. Granted, he's a more great nerd than I am, but nonetheless, you're an honorary nerd, sir. Um, well, so we're you. in a nerd yeah. mind meld. So <laughs> in terms of sharing the gospel, I had this pulled up here. Uh, Matthew 28 um, verses, let's start with very purposefully verse 19. Um, there, This is the Great Commission, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Great Commission, point blank, period. In your book, The Gospel Precisely, chapter 5, the entire discussion is on how do we share the gospel. You just kind of touched on that. You know, COVID can be a, 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 a impetus for us sharing the gospel. Touch on that. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how do we share the gospel? In and outside of COVID, like the COVID thing was just a, a random example that I use. But yeah. in general, like, what are your thoughts on sharing the gospel with this perspective of Jesus's kingship and allegiance to him in mind? Um, and I, 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 sorry for such a long rambling question, but I am very purposely in the back of my mind thinking on what you said in one of your other books. And guys, if you, if you first of all, I am going to, I promised a couple of giveaways. First giveaway is going to be to Patrick Marriott, um, who so far has invited the most people by a long shot to um, come into this blog and um, and listen to it. So thanks for that, Patrick. Please um, DM, private message me, um, your um, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, any one of them, Bible Hacking. Um, private message me your email, and I will get you a version of any one of Dr. Bates' books that you don't have yet. Um, I'm assuming Gospel Precisely. If not, I'll do one of the older ones as well. Um, guys, if you don't have both the Gospel Precisely and Gospel Allegiance, get both. They are awesome books. Anyway, I also have a book for um, the first question that we had, which was um, Mr. Phil Fox. Same to you, brother. Message me your um, email address, and I will get you that ebook immediately. Um, and we have an ebook as well for Michelle Turner, someone because she's an awesome admin and uh, moderator of the chat. Where I didn't even ask her to come, and she just started moderating. God, you know, you got to appreciate sisters like that. So that's three giveaways already. There will be plenty more during the course of this. Back to the question. In, I believe it was Gospel Allegiance, Dr. Bates, um, you, touch, you touched on what I think you called it 
easy breezy Christianity or something along those lines and how, you know, we have this, this kind of an easy, you know, concept of, you know, you can just kind of repeat after me, you know, and boom, go about your business. And now you have your, your access card to heaven. And, and that's problematic. Um, how are we supposed to share the gospel if it's not just about, you know, get, you know, scaring people or tricking people or convincing people or guilting people, some are good, some are bad, whatever, um, whichever methodology into saying that, you know, sinner's prayer, what's the actual way we should share the gospel? Yeah. Um, we should start by saying Jesus is King. Um, <laughs> we, we may not, that actually may not be the very first thing we say. It's the most important thing we say. Um, I actually think the most, the, probably the most effective strategy is to be real with people and be vulnerable. People really resonate with authenticity. Um, doubly so maybe in our current era, but probably always, right? I think that's always true. Um, and I think that a, a good starting place is to talk about where you um, have not allowed Jesus to be king in your life and what that looked like for you. And that that's something you can speak of both from a non-Christian perspective. It could be like, okay, when I wasn't a Christian at all, like here's what my life looked like because Jesus wasn't king and I was, you know, um, I was addicted to pornography or like I was, um, you know, ladder climbing and um, just trying to, 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 you know, just get a better job so I could make more money, but I, I was empty. I didn't even know for what, right. Or, or whatever it might be that your, your issue is that you you've struggled with or whether it's pride or lack of forgiveness or uh, resentment, whatever you've struggled with, there's been moments where you haven't allowed Jesus to be King in your life. And that could be because you didn't know Jesus at all, or it could be because you were walking with him as a disciple, but you weren't really fulfilling your your discipleship you had um maybe you had not really taken an oath to jesus as king right mm -hmm. maybe you had like signed on for him to be your savior but you weren't really aware that he should be the lord of your life um or maybe you were aware of it but you just didn't think it mattered very much because you weren't taught that it mattered all that mattered was you prayed this prayer and okay well i guess he's the lord too so that's neat but it had no bite right there was no like it didn't really matter. At least that's how it was. It was presented to you. Um, so you didn't allow Jesus to be Lord, right? And what happened, right? Um, you probably have a story about how your life really didn't actually turn out so swell. Um, you were hoping that it would, but um, you created your own moral framework. Uh, you made your own decisions apart from His kingship. Uh, you weren't being a servant leader to other people. Um, you weren't. You weren't picking up your cross and and following the king and things didn't work out well. So I would start sharing there and say, and then, right? And then I realized uh, that I needed to repent from this, this choice that I had made. And I needed to give Jesus kingship over that area of my life. And when I did, you can say, I found that it was so hard. Or I found that like, okay, being a disciple is not as easy as I thought it was, but now I had hope and, and I had a community with me and I had the Holy Spirit behind me. And I, and I began to, to strive for this. I'm still struggling, but, um, but I, I'm confident, right, that, that God is going to finish this work in me as I keep looking at the sun, right? That's who I'm going to be like. I'm going to be like that King Jesus because he is the image of God, and I'm going to be conformed to his image, and I'm on a path, right? Um, that's, I think, how we share the gospel effectively is, is um to begin there. Now, there's a lot of other things we can share too. We need, we need to talk about the cross. We need to talk about the resurrection, the incarnation, his 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 return. Uh, we can get into the details of the gospel more, but the the point of contact is kingship. Let's do that. So spot on, love it. Point of contact is kingship, and I think that alone, most of our audience here is kind of Western culture, not necessarily American, but you know that Western hemisphere type of a, a, a worldview. So I think that alone is disruptive and countercultural to where we are now. You know, Christianity now is looked at, you know, as counter to what the Bible says. Again, you know, it's basically looked at as a means for profit, uh, and I don't only mean financial profit, but you know, people sign up for Christianity because they believe it will be, you know, the thing that makes their life easier. The approach you just said basically says the diametric opposite of that. So I like that. But let's unpack that deeper. You said we could go deeper into, you know, the other aspects of the gospel. Unpack a little bit of that for me, please. Yeah. So if I was to give a, a kind of a, a condensed summary of the gospel that's a little bigger than just saying Jesus is king, um, I would want to maybe say Jesus is saving king or liberating king and, and want to put in 
a message that helps people know a little bit that he's a servant king, something more that is rescuing you and wants to supply you benefits. Now, those benefits come through a transformation, a cross-shaped transformation. So anyway, but but if we were to give like the bigger gospel as, and, and all these, I think, 10 statements that I'm going to give that unpack the gospel or things that we could show that the Bible says are part of the gospel in more than one place. Um, and so what are these 10 things that I would say are, are events that make up the gospel? All right, so the, the whole gospel or the framework would be to say Jesus is the, is the king. All right, now, how did he become the king or what does that look like? Now, that's really the unpacking the details of the gospel. So uh, we would want to say first he preexisted as God the Son alongside God the Father as part of the, the triune God. Um, and then uh, he was sent by the Father, right, and took on human flesh. Uh, and when he uh, took on human flesh, we call this the incarnation. And uh, as we unpack this even further, I'll maybe I'll circle back and talk more about the incarnation and how that connects to glory. Uh, if you if you want, Greg, we'll go there next. All right. But anyway, uh, and then uh, after taking on human flesh, of course, Jesus then uh, lives a human life, dies for our sins in accordance with the scripture. And this uh, reminds us that uh, this is part of God's Old Testament plan, right? That he'd promised these things in advance. Uh, he was buried, uh, so his 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 death was real, right? Uh, and then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Uh, and then he was seen by many witnesses, again, uh, confirming the reality of his resurrection uh, was something that was attested by witnesses. Uh, and then after being seen by many witnesses, he ascends to the right hand of God the Father. And that's the part I think we really missed uh, in our church culture, is that the climax of the gospel in the New Testament, where the New Testament puts the most energy on gospel as gospel, is that Jesus is the Christ, which means he's the king, which means he's ruling. And in order to rule, he has to be enthroned. Right. So in Acts, when he ascends mm. to the, the right hand of God the Father, that's the moment at which he becomes the human and the divine king forever. Right Now, before that, in a sense, he was always the divine king, but that's where he becomes the human and the divine king ruling at the right hand of the God. Uh, from that position, then the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to apply the benefits of the gospel to our lives. Uh, and then Jesus will come again as the ruler and the judge. Oh, that would be uh, the gospel precisely, uh, as I call it, right? Uh, and to develop those points further uh, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the book. You touched on glory. Um, I, I'm going to interpret that as kingship um chapter three in your book probably my favorite chapter not to be you know picky um but the title of the chapter is how is jesus's kingship beneficial um and i like this you quote you you write in the in this in this chapter jesus king jesus frees us from our misguided self rule talk to us about that a bit misguided self-rule yeah misguided self-rule well you know this harkens back to this to you know the foundational story in the bible the story of the fall right and adam and eve's disobedience as um, adam and eve eat the fruit and it's very specific fruit it's of the knowledge of the uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it's fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which has to do with our ethics our moral decision making like our choices about what's right and what's wrong and so I, I, I would say this, that sin, as we distill it down to its most pure form, what does pure sin look like for us? Um, pure sin means that although God is king, and as the king, he is the great lawgiver because he made us and he knows how we will best work, he gives us commands, right? And um, those commands are things like, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, do not murder. Like we could we could list out various commands that God gives, right? Um, and we, um, instead of obeying those commands, we say, you know, actually, I think life will work better if I do it my way. Um, and so we, we turn away from God's commands, and in so doing, we begin to fail to bear his image fully to the rest of creation. So I would see that we're created to rule on God's behalf, Part of that in, connects to our image bearing, and our image bearing is to project God's glory outward so that other people, other creatures will encounter God's glory through us. And that what happens when we sin then is that our, our, our image bearing capacity gets distorted or mangled or disfigured. So instead of bearing God's glory to other people, when people see us, they can't see God's glory radiating through. And so we end up with a glory deficit in creation. So the gospel, as Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, he describes the gospel as the gospel of the glory of the Christ, the image of God. 
the gospel of the glory of the Christ, meaning the king, the image of God. So what Paul's doing there is he's helping us to see that the gospel is about the restoration of the glory of God to all creation, um, and that that's really the purpose of the gospel. So there's a negative purpose in the sense that we need our sins forgiven, right? But there's also a positive purpose that God's saving us for a reason, and that's because he wants creation to experience his glory. And, and it, it sounds like you're saying those that. two things are inextricably connected. The negative consequence and the so the, the the saving us from our sin and the radiating his glory out to the world. Right. It sounds like those two things are part and parcel of it. Like you can't just get the saving from the sin and disregard the radiating of his glory out to the world. Am I hearing you correctly? You're, there? you're hearing me right. And, um, and we would see this, for instance, in Romans 3.23, where, where, where Paul says, all have sinned. And what does he say next? Come short. And fall short of the glory of God. Now that fall short of the glory of God, right, is oftentimes repackaged by people who are trying to systemize the Bible as just another way of saying that we're like unrighteous, Seriously. okay? Yeah. So we've, 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 we have sinned and then we're unrighteous. But that's not what Paul says. Right? He says we fall short of the glory of God. And if you go back into Romans 1, Paul talks about a glory exchange, right? How when we worship idols, uh, we exchange the glory of the immortal God, right? Paul says, for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. And so what happens is when we worship idols, right? And um, whether that's our idols like sex, money, power, whatever those idols might be, and what we're doing is we're exchanging the glory of God for something empty, something bankrupt, something vain, and that devolves onto us, right? We, we then begin to lose our ability to radiate God's glory outward to other people. Um, and so that's why we sin and we fall short of the glory of God. Right. And so we're not spreading the glory of God to the rest of creation. Let me give props real quick to a couple of scholars who have done some nice work um, on this theme. Um, uh, three that come to mind, Carmen Imes, um, uh, yeah. Haley, uh, Haley Jacob, um, who's uh, got a book called um, Conformed to the Image of the Sun. Um, and then Jackson Wu, um, and Jackson Wu has some really helpful work on the gospel uh, for those of you who are looking for more conversation partners on the gospel. Um, but in uh, uh, his book, um, well, what's the name of the book? Um, it's on my shelf. I should look at it over there somewhere. Um, Reading Romans with Eastern Eyes uh, is the name of the book. Uh, he does some very nice work on uh, honor and glory exchange, showing how actually human glory and God's glory are bound up together. Um, in interesting ways. So yeah, let me let me just give props to some some other scholars who are doing some fine work. Awesome. Now you have again mind meldedly um, answered a question that was there. Can you inf how can you influence current culture of Christ being made a mere vehicle for escapism? And then you've already answered the what other resources other than yours would you recommend? But dive into that top front part for us. How do we influence our current culture? of Christ being a mere vehicle for escapism. Yeah, um, I think that some of that is, you know, contextualizing Christianity in a more thoroughly, thoroughly embodied way, um, helping people to see that um, whenever we talk about Jesus as king, right, that whenever we come together as a church, if we're not confessing Jesus as king in an authentic way, if we're not saying, you are king over my life, Jesus, right? Um, then the church doesn't isn't the church. It ceases to be the church. Like that's what constitutes the church in the first place. When when Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ, right? That's whenever Jesus says, "Okay, well, on this I can build my church." Right? It's it's Peter in his capacity as the confessor, right? Like what's he done? He's confessed Jesus is the Christ. That's what that's what the church is. That's why it, like like the, there's now a chance to build on that. Because every time we come together and we confess him to be the Christ, what we do is we we allow the spirit to create a new social and political body that's governed by something else. OK, like if we come together and we're like just singing some songs or we're just doing whatever, if we are not really like declaring Jesus to be king over our lives, then Jesus isn't really ruling there. Right. And um when we come together and we confess him as the king, the Holy Spirit is present and ruling. So Jesus takes ownership and a new social and political force is unleashed in the world that is a real world force. It's us, right? It's the church. It's an embodied kind of happening. Um, and so, so many of our Christian ideas have gotten disembodied. That's a, a, a lot of the problem. Like, okay, like, okay, so the whole point is that you believe disembodied, like, you know, Jesus 
died for your sins and then you can go to heaven, escapism, disembodied, right? Um, if we instead realize, okay, no, actually what Jesus is calling us to is pistis, which means something relational and externalized, right? It's not something I just do in my mind. It's something that I do in relationship with other people. Wow. And it's something that is externally expressed. It's something I do with my body, right? Um, well, well, then we begin to see that there's whole dimensions of Christianity that there are running counter to this sort of escapism, right? Um, and we say like, no, it's actually not about just getting to heaven. It's about God wanting to to do his new creation work in the midst of this creation. The new creation is breaking in. His resurrection power is already at work, and it's already at work through real people who have real bodies, who are really actually serving as stewards over this real world. Um, and so I think we have to make sure we're yeah, we're, 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 we're having an embodied, um, holistic teaching. Awesome. Uh, you have dropped some truth bomb nuggets in here so far. This is phenomenal. We have another question here. I want to jump straight to the questions before time runs out. And again, thank you both the audience for your engagement, as well as you, Dr. Bates, for your time and the effort you've put into this. And I don't just mean the hour time here. I mean, like all of the research you've done, your, I want to say your life's work, because I've seen in my own life that even, you know, stuff that was happening in my life at 12 years old has shaped me for, you know, some of the stuff that God is starting to expose that, hey, I, I've actually been setting you up to do this. So, I can imagine that your life's work is exactly the same way. So thank you for just being obedient and being a conduit for, you know, kind of reinvigorating us about the gospel and the fact that it's externalized and it's more than just belief. Question here from Cynthia. Uh, Messiah and Christ, are those royalty titles in the entire New Testament? Yes. <laughs> That's a short one. Uh, yeah, they are. Like Chris, Christos, I mean, the word Christos means like a, a certain kind of, you know, um, king that was to come in the line of David and to re restore the fortunes of his people. Now, it means anointed one. And um, within the whole of Second Temple Judaism, um, we could have bigger discussions about the range of meaning of Christos. Um, and if you want to get into scholarly resources on this more, I would recommend uh, Matthew Novenson's Christ Among the Messiahs. And he has a, no a second book on uh, messianism. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, but he would lead you through some of that material on, um, on Messiah and, and Christ language. But uh, yeah, as we find it in the New Testament applied to Jesus, um, it, it has to do with his royal office. So let me dig deeper into that. Historically, in the historical context, then of the Gospels, I want to say it was um, probably it was in the beginning of one of the Gospels. It was probably Matthew, where it kind of opens up with the Gospel of you know the Messiah, et cetera, et cetera. If those are royalty titles, are those then um, problematic titles that borderline suborn? Um, you know, lack of allegiance to the actual royalty that was there at the time, i.e. Rome. So like, are these um, seditious things for the gospel writers to be putting pen to paper or whatever, they, whatever means they were writing with in those days to say, hey, this is Messiah, this is King. Unpack that a bit more for us. How proper, yeah, how big think, of a statement is that for them to actually say yeah, that? Yeah, I would I would say that um we we could we could safely say that it was risky and that it could be perceived as seditious and in fact we see in Acts right it is in Acts seventeen right where you know the, the you know Paul and Barnabas are accused of proclaiming another king right um and um it, it was clearly understood as seditious in that context um and and so we we do find examples right where um in the new testament it is but i think it's better to say that um that the response varied um that that there was as jesus was proclaimed as king um it was recognized that he was uh a a divine and human king that was enthroned in glory and and ruling over heaven and earth um and that that uh that didn't mean that there was a um like a lack of any kind of human rule or um, or total human disorder, right? Um, as, uh, you know, of course, we have the statements in the New Testament that want to say you should be obedient to authorities, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that we would want to say that it wasn't entirely incompatible with um, the, the claim, for instance, that Caesar is Lord, but partially incompatible and could be fully incompatible depending on the context. Um, 
So I think it's too simplistic to say um, that that the message was like, Jesus is Lord, therefore Caesar is not. Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would say that it, that saying that Jesus is Lord did mean that Jesus was the ultimate authority and that that in that in some ways conditions Caesar's authority. But that doesn't mean that Caesar has no authority as Lord either. Gotcha. Uh, that would be wrong. Like the, the, there can be tiers of authority. Right. And that um, we have to be careful in um, nuancing that properly because the New Testament wants to suggest that we should still submit to proper authority. Uh, just because Jesus is king doesn't mean that there is no else is. Um, need to submit to leaders, for instance, as we're called to submit to leaders in a variety of ways. Good stuff. We have another audience question here. Um, very interesting one here. Is, is some of the lack of kingship and that's, you know, the idea of kingship purveying American evangelicalism, Western evangelicalism, et cetera, due to early Americans trying to break away from the crown. Um, maybe more of an emphasis on individual sovereignty. Yeah. Um, well, certainly we see a lot of emphasis on individual sovereignty, right, in our um, in our current cultural context as, as everybody wants to be king of their own life. Um, no doubt about that. Um, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> You're muted. Sorry, I, I had to cough and I muted and then I didn't unmute properly. Um, still working out a cold there. Um, so, yeah, when we think about this kingship issue, um, one of the things that's difficult is that I would say that it's it's a larger problem than just our American context, because we can see it from the late medieval period. And as the late medieval period, like moves into the Reformation era, the Protestant Reformation, on both sides of the aisle, there's not a strong emphasis on Jesus's kingship. Um, we do see some, it's not like that theme is entirely absent from the Protestant Reformation or on the Catholic side either, um, but it's just not what they're mostly all about. They tend to see Christ as an alternative way of just referring to Jesus, so that like anytime you see the language of Christ, um, then that tends to just get used as um, interchangeably with Jesus. Um, as a kind of a personal reference. Um, and the problem is that tends to evacuate it of its royal, um, of its royal meaning. So um, whenever we are uh, attentive to that royal meaning, um, that, that helps us. So what I would say this, though, that our North American context that is very anti, um, you know, anti-crown, um, anti-king, um, that very much emphasizes, you know, Republican or Democratic ideals, um, has maybe made it harder for us to see hmm. the theme of Jesus's kingship and the call to allegiance than would have otherwise been the case. I wonder if the recovery that we're seeing through N.T. Wright's work, Scott McKnight's work, yep. you know, whatever I've contributed to that as well, um, if the recovery of the kingship motif that we're seeing, um, I, I think, beginning to sweep through scholarship and, to the, and the churches, if it would have been seen earlier if it wasn't for that um, that amp, that sort of anti-imperial um, um, yeah, framework. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is quite frankly, quite mind shattering, paradigm shifting stuff. Thank you again. Um, a couple of quick comments. I have um, at least three more giveaways. I have a giveaway for, I'm scrolling to find the name that I wanna hopefully pronounce right. Ortho Lou, please shoot me a message with your email address. I will get you whichever one of Dr. Bates' books you don't have yet. Um, same for um, Joshua Sherman uh, from Tending Our Nets. Thanks for jumping in, bro. And um, same thing, shoot me your email, just private message, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, whichever one, and I will get you whichever one of Dr. Bates' books you don't have. Also, guys, Tending Our Nets. Uh, awesome podcast that breaks down the gospel into quick, I think it's seven to 10 minute chunks. And like he adheres to everything that Dr. Bates has been talking about. Yeah, thank you, Joshua. Um, You've been doing some good work. Yeah, for, for real, for real, for real. And there was one other one, um, Lelia Bell. I was, I think, the earliest, if not like the second commenter on today's chat. Thanks for joining us. Lelia, same thing. Message me your email address. I will get you uh, whatever um, of Dr. Bates' book or books that you do not have yet. And then the last one that I can think of right now is Carmel 
Carmel Crunk for always being like on every podcast, every live stream, Carmel Crunk is there. Good looking out, Carmel. Send me the info. I will get you whichever one of those books you have. Um, it'll be ebooks. So you'll, all of you will get the books today. Like, so it's awesome. No waiting on mail or anything like that. So um, we got very little time. We got seven more minutes. Um, any other questions? y'all here in the chat please put up you know the big word question and then ask your question um before um we have to bounce um for dr bates has to probably go back to teaching a class or doing something hey i had a meeting early. today but it's canceled so we can go a few minutes over oh um, well it's canceled <laughs> for me because i've been sick they don't want me in the room <laughs> i'm i'm feeling better i'm much better it was just a cold not COVID or anything yeah. but um but the I, nature yeah. of the society we yeah. find ourselves yeah, in they, now if you even yeah. cough funny, that's right it's uh, like, oh, it's, we don't want to take the chance. Stay away. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. all yeah. good. Um, any other um, any other questions in there? Any other thoughts, um, um, <clears throat> Doctor Bates? Um, maybe one of your one of your other books. Um, give us a bullet point, uh, something that ties into this. I want to say specifically around faith, but I'll, I'll leave it to dealer's choice. What else ties into this that is super important, that's super relevant that you, you would say would, would be a good closing thought? Yeah. Um, well, I think that this conversation is obviously really important to the whole uh, conversation about grace, um, about works, about um, how uh, how these ideas of Jesus's kingship um can can fit within a comprehensive system that makes sense of all that the Bible teaches. Um, so one of the things that I really work hard to do in gospel allegiance, um, really following um, the work of other scholars, especially the work of John Barclay, um, but other people's work too, who have done work on patronage and, and patron-client relationships in the ancient world, is to help set grace um, in a broader framework. Um, and John Barclay, for instance, has six different dimensions of grace that he he says um, different um, authors and thinkers during our New Testament time period, um, they, they, they perfected um, that dimension of grace or didn't, right? There were six possible ways in which grace was understood. And he talks about ways in which um, certain thinkers tended to draw that out to a full conclusion or tended to minimize that dimension of grace. So let me give you a few examples. Like the one that probably first comes to our mind when we think about grace would be the question of merit, right? Is um, it, grace is something that we tend to automatically think, well, if it's grace, it means I didn't deserve it. Um, actually, John Barclay shows that that kind of thinking was very unusual in the ancient world. Most of the time, um, gifts were given to people who deserved it. Um, you don't give a grace. A grace is gift language. You don't give a grace to someone who doesn't deserve it because they may squander the gift, right? Um, instead, you give um, a gift to somebody who deserves it. Um, so actually, in Paul and Jesus's use of grace, um, they were flowing against the stream. The word grace doesn't automatically mean unmerited, would be one of the things that um, that, uh, that John Barclay shows, but that Paul um, understood God's specific gift, the gospel, right? He understood that specific grace to be unmerited, um, and uh, and that he gave it to God gave it to humanity when we didn't deserve it, but that was an unusual thing for God to do, right? Um, so the very thing that we think defines grace, we see is actually an unusual understanding of grace in the New Testament, and that begins to unpack a whole bunch of different things about grace, including the idea, maybe most importantly, um, that actually grace demands a response. It demands a return gift. Um, that uh, grace, we tend to think, well, if it's a really good gift, then you you don't have to give anything back. That would violate grace, we think. Barclay shows that actually that thinking is entirely foreign to the New Testament, including Paul, uh, and that Paul believed you have to give a return gift to grace. And what would that return gift be? It would be allegiance and especially obedience, allegiant obedience. Uh, that's what uh, the proper um, response to grace is in order to make the gift effective uh, and that grace is also effective. Anyway, we could get into a whole long conversations <laughs> about grace, faith, works, how they all interface. And I think that's especially important for those of you who are leaders, uh, probably most of you are, um, and they're teaching other people. You'll be getting questions like, um, you know, people will quote Ephesians, you know, 2, 8 through 10 and say, you know, for it is by grace we've been saved through faith. Um, this is not by works. Um, how does this King Jesus teaching fit in with all that? I try to walk um, through that um, in detail in gospel allegiance um, to equip um, to equip leaders to handle those kinds of conversations. So you, you, you bring up an interesting thought. Um, back to faith, 
back to allegiance, you know, faith pistis being more of a, um, as you said, externally relational type of a thing. How do you then correlate the inf uh, the, the the popular um, verses in Hebrews eleven, you know, the beginning of Hebrews eleven, where faith seems to be defined as largely a mental exercise, believing, and especially when you look back at Abraham, wasn't Abraham's faith simply a matter of what he believed? Like Yahweh told him, you know, go to X Y Z land, and he believed it. Like sort that out for us a bit. Yeah. So, um, you know, the passage in Hebrews where it, it talks about, you know, um, faith, you know, and um, speaks about it in, in terms of hope and certainty, especially. I mean, we wouldn't want to say that faith is devoid of mental activity or that it's not important. Um, but one of the th <coughs> things you'll notice that the author of Hebrews does immediately afterwards is he goes on and talks about uh, how people actually acted on the basis of their hope. Right and did things uh, in order to demonstrate that their that their hope was was certain, right and real. So it did involve an embodiment. Um, we wouldn't want to kind of notice that it wasn't just a disembodied kind of thing, right? Um, but he he goes on and lists what all the heroes of the faith have done, right? And they all um, took various actions. Um, similarly, when we talk about Abraham believing God and it being credited to him as righteousness. Um, we should realize in the context, Abraham is being asked to um, not just trust the promises of God, right? Um, he is called to do that, but he's also called to do so in a bodily way, right? He actually has a very specific problem. Like he has um, no heir. That's the context, right? Is he has no, uh, no heir. And so uh, somebody who is just a servant in his estate is going to inherit uh, his whole estate. And, um, and he says, God, you made these marvelous promises to me, but I don't have a son. Um, and then God specifically um, tells him to, to um, you know, that it's going to be through Sarah, his wife, that he's going to have a son. So trusting the promises for Abraham meant actually that he needed to follow through with his body. He actually had to have sex with his wife. It's actually what's in view, right, in terms of um, the embodiment of his trust, right, as an expression of it. So I think that we can be simplistic in how we construe some of those things. Um, we wouldn't want to say that Abraham uh, and his trust of God, God doesn't involve a kind of embodiment. Um, anyway, I get into those passages in more detail in Gospel Allegiance. I spend three or four you know, pages just on that one passage um, in um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Genesis 15, 6 passage. Um, so you can go yeah, to, to that for some more details. Awesome. I got to appreciate also, and this is just lockstep in line with what we like here at Bible Hacking, consistently you keep referencing scriptures, both Old and New Testament. I appreciate that significantly, Dr. Bates. Um, you know, a, a lot of scholars write a lot of stuff, and sometimes it's difficult for a me, a, a lay person, and the audience often being lay people, to parse, like, which, what part of this is your opinion and what part of this is drawn directly from the Bible? I appreciate you so blatantly tying this back to scripture consistently. Thank you for that. We have one more question here. Um, this one is very interesting. How do we, who are walking towards the kingship module, expedite the process? Maybe a few points of practical examples of life application. So how do we walk towards that um, displaying yeah. or radiating the glory outwards. And I want to I, I want to stare your answer a bit if I can. You've referenced several times already porn addictions, struggling with the flesh, et cetera, et cetera. Like in the context of us living our Christian lives, struggling with whatever it is we struggle with, lying, pride, greed, porn addiction, whatever have you, how do we, exp how can we, even if not expedite, how can we, you know, push that process along as best we can. Gosh, I wish I, you know, had a, you know, seven steps to make following Jesus easier, um, you know, program for you. Um, taking up the cross is pretty hard uh, and it's a lifelong, uh, a lifelong process. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to suggest that I have answers that I don't have as I'm, you know, I'm on a journey too. It's a, it's a journey toward healing. Right. Um, and I, I won't reach that um, fullness, um, you know, until I've walked with the Lord longer um, and until I see him in glory. But um, scripture does give us um, some hints that I think are helpful. Um, one, I think, is uh, very translatable to our culture, and that is the issue of images. Right. As um, you know, we're just surrounded by images, um, a lot of them violent or sexual or um, or just um, images um, that cause us to um, 
uh, to uh, covet what other people have, like whether it's the life that we think they live as we see it on the internet, right? And it's some, you know, uh, carefully edited and curated version of their life that we're seeing as an image. Um, but we see those images and they're powerful to us. They, um, we, we, we are drawn into images and we worship false images. Um, and so one of the things the Bible reminds us to do is to keep the image of the sun before our eyes. And I, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with um, the practice of using holy icons, um, if that helps you um, as a way of like, you know, having an image of Jesus in front of you. Like if that reminds you of his holy life and his life story um, and, and you can put that before your eyes. Um, well, the process of being conformed to the image of the sun is the goal. Now, it's not going to happen magically by you looking at a picture, though, either, I don't think. Um, that, that really, I mean, the, the reason the Bible gives us no physical description of Jesus, I'm convinced, is because um, we are to um, be drawn into his character qualities and into his life story. And we have to, we have to construct an image of him around those things, right? And so that we have to constantly be holding before our eyes the ways in which Jesus was forgiving or the ways in which Jesus turned the other cheek or the ways in which he he called to not just uh, perform the law as an external right, but to um, have an internal match from the heart, right? All these kinds of things we have to we have to keep before our eyes Jesus. So whatever helps you do that, um, that will accelerate your process of transformation into the image, right? Because that's the goal is that as we gaze upon the image of the sun, we're being transformed, as Paul says, from glory into glory, right? Um, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, Paul talks about how um, gazing on the image, right, allows our glory to be recharged and that eventually come to be conformed to the image of the sun as we gaze upon him. And that's the goal. That's the end process. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. We are significantly past your time, sir. I want to thank you very, very, very much again. Um, thank you, the entire audience, for thank being you, engaged everyone. with us. Um, this was awesome. Um, very, very much appreciated, sir. I hope to have you back again soon. Uh, maybe we unpack just um, gospel allegiance next time. Um, um, whatever. Uh, it'll be, you know, you have carte blanche anytime you want to um, be here with us and share content with the audience. The audience, obviously, it res your content resonates with this audience a lot. So thank you for that. Um, remember the people that I listed off earlier to um, private message me, Ortho Lou and a couple other people still need to private message me your email address so I can get you the e-copy of the ebook of Dr. Dr. Bates, um, his book, whichever one you don't have yet. Um, thank you, everyone. This was amazing. Um, Dr. Bates, you have a great, great day. Grace and peace to you, sir. And um, have a good thank one, you. everyone.